I think that it's most helpful uh, to describe what I attempted to do in the book of what are the things that led me to write the book. Um, it seems to me that violence uh, is a term that one hears every day in the media, uh, newspapers, and one is constantly uh, faced with images of violence uh, in, uh, on the news, on the news in the United States every night about somebody, another bomb going off, people being killed. Uh, and <clears throat> what really provoked me is that uh, there is all this talk about it, I th talk about violence, and yet it seemed to me that there was very little thinking about what we really mean by violence. What are the types of violence? Um, and um, being a philosopher, that's what I, I wanted. What, are, what does it really mean in this particular age and how it relates to uh, many different aspects of human life? And uh, once you make that decision, then the literature is overwhelming. I mean, you could deal with it in many, many different ways. Uh, you can deal with it in terms of uh, popular incidents of terrorism. You could deal with it in terms of the Middle East. You could deal with it in terms of drug trade. But I, uh, I decided n not to get into all these things, but rather to select a number of thinkers that I think have been some of the most interesting thinkers of the 20th century in dealing with the meaning of violence. Um, and the other thing that I noted is that uh, constantly these are thinkers that any intellectual who discusses violence frequently comes back to one of these thinkers. So I uh, focus just really on five thinkers because I think it, uh, I'm not trying to give a typology of violence, but really different aspects uh, of it. So I deal with Carl Schmidt and then Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt, uh, 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 Fanon, and Jan Osman. Um, and in each case, the book is structured as a dialogue with them, trying to really see what it is that they're saying and what I think is, uh, uh, in general, right or wrong about it. And then the book ends with a chapter in which I try to integrate the views that I've come to about the nature of violence uh, in the end. I could say a little bit more about some of the themes that I'm highlighting. One of the reasons I began with uh, Carl Schmidt is because uh, I was very perplexed and disturbed uh, of why there has been such a revival of interest in uh, Schmidt. And what's interesting about Carl Schmidt is uh, almost every significant thinker that, or many significant thinkers in the 20th century, I mean, whether it be Kojev or Derrida or Agamben or Habermas, uh, or have felt the need to deal with Carl Schmidt. Uh, my view, I didn't want to get into a polemic in the sense of his Nazi period. But what I find, um, and it really is a means for dealing with contemporary issues, because I understand why people, even on the left, can find Schmidt attractive, but I think it's deeply mistaken. And I'm, uh, I focus just on his early work before he was uh, joined the Nazi party, but to try and show that the whole attempt to ridicule and to undermine a normative perspective is, uh, is uh, a very dangerous perspective, so I, it's very critical of uh, Schmidt. Uh, I then move to Walter Benjamin, and I focus really not on Walter. In all, all of these cases, uh, it's a very narrow focus, because I wanted to get into deeply. It's fascinating that his essay, 
the uh, critique of violence uh, in German, the, the Krieg der Gewalt, is a short essay, but it's probably the most discussed essay on violence that I know of. Um, and it's interesting what people always are trying to make of this essay, particularly the distinction that he makes between mythic violence and divine violence. I mean, this is uh, a concept that becomes important for people like Zizek, for Judith Butler, for Simon Gritchley, and for Derrida in his famous article, The Force of Law. Um, and there, uh, the question that I... His essay is an extremely cryptic and obscure essay. It's a short essay. And he wrote it only when he was in his 20s. It was practically unknown until the 60s. And uh, I asked myself the question, why are people so fascinated with this particular essay? And I don't think it's... My answer, short answer, is not because I think it gives any theory, or, but it raises many deep questions that anybody who wants to think about violence has to think about. I mean, it raises the question of law and violence, of religion and violence, of an alternative to breaking the cycle of violence. I do not think you find the answers to these questions in Benjamin, but it's, but it's there. I then moved to Hannah Arendt, and uh, in many ways I'm deeply sympathetic with Hannah Arendt, particularly she wants to make an extremely strong distinction between power and violence. Now, her idea of power is very unconventional. It's most ideas of power are power over someone, control, getting either individual or the state. Her idea of power is primarily empowerment, power growing from, uh, from the people. Uh, and uh, the and she actually argues that power, in this sort of sense, and violence are antithetical. That violence is instrumental. That violence can never achieve a really positive result. Okay. Um, then I take up Fanon, and uh, what's interesting is the primary essay on violence that Hannah Arendt wrote was because she was very disturbed by the rhetoric of uh, Fanon in, that was becoming very popular in the uh, 19, late 1960s and 70s, where it's being read as a glorification of violence. When I read Fanon carefully, I felt that this is a complete misinterpretation. It seems to me what, what uh, Fanon, and certain passages taken out of context, I think what Fanon was primarily concerned is what I would call a kind of phenomenology of colonial violence, of the extent to which it systematically dehumanizes people. That's what his main interest is, um, with also the idea that uh, you, know, you reach the limits in colonial violence of trying to negotiate or discuss so that the idea of calling for a kind of revolutionary action is a reaction to the depth of colonial violence. And in a way, I, it struck me as when I was writing the book that uh, despite the uh, seeming antithesis between uh, Arendt and Fanon, that they really were more complementary that you, you can't make an easy solution putting them together. But even Arendt recognizes there are certain occasions in which violence can be, if not justified, as necessary. Indeed, but people, many people do not know that uh, when prior to the Second World War, she was arguing for an international Jewish army not an Israeli army, a policy, to fight fascism in, about this. Well, that's engaging in an act of violence because of, of things. So there's an extreme situation where it can be justified, and you could see, you could read Fanon as arguing that as the situation that he was facing at that particular time was also one of these extreme situations. And then the last chapter that I dealt with is Jan Osman, and I dealt with Ong Jan Osman. Um, uh, 
he's one of my favorite thinkers because he's such an interesting thinker, and uh, it begins to bring in the dimension of religious violence. I think lots of people have misunderstood Osman, but um, when he discusses, maybe this will come out later when we talk, uh, what he calls the... Um, uh, my interest in Osman began because I wrote a book myself on Freud and his interpretation of uh, Freud, the Freud's book on Moses. And uh, Osman uh, speaks about the kind of mosaic distinction. The, no, the aspect of religion which becomes exclusive, where there is one and only one God. And uh, I think his attempt is subtle in this, but it helps us to understand certain dimensions, I think, of religious bias. So, though I'm dealing with thinkers, uh, I think that in the process, uh, I deal with violence in many different contexts. Violence as it relates to law, violence as it relates to power, violence as it relates to religion. So, in my opinion, my own opinion of the book, it's, um, it's uh, a modest book. I'm certainly not coming up with any grand theory about violence. I don't believe there can be a grand theory. I think that there are different kinds of insights in which you can see both uh, 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 different ways of thinking about it and some of the types of dangers. But um, And I use the subtitle. I... Um, I expression from Harold Rent, thinking without banisters, uh, because I think it's not as if you have some foundation, something that's accepted, that you can then really speak about this, that the, you don't have those, but you have to constantly engage in thinking and rethinking of what is the meaning of violence, what are the ways of opposing violence, um, etc. So that's those that gives you a brief idea of what I tried to do in this book.